Hey everyone, I'm your host, Robbie Straczynski, and thanks so much for joining me on episode number 25 of Cards Chat, the friendliest poker podcast in town. Today we welcome a poker player who's earned over $1 million in online and live tournaments and cash games. He's a longtime poker coach with great training material for both on and off the felt, and you can also find him regularly crushing it in the Twitch streets. He's the man known as Grips. Evan Jarvis, welcome to the Cards Chat Podcast. Robbie, thanks so much for having me on. Thanks for inviting me, and thanks for that. Uh, I think that's the nicest intro I've ever received. Well, the check's in the mail, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, you, wait, you don't want the Bitcoin anymore? Because I was fine to do crypto, but... Well, it depends like... on the day, you know, with the way okay, it goes up. Sure that, I can't handle that kind of variance. I'm just more into the poker variance. Can you handle the three weeks it might take for this check to come through, though? Uh, Things are slow these days. That is true. That is true. Well, I'll just keep on introducing everybody because I love them. It's good. It's good stuff. It's good to see you, man. You doing all right? Having a good day today? I'm doing fantastic, man. I I slept in a little bit, but, you know, I just wanted to make sure I was nice and well rested for the podcast because I was actually really excited about this. Such is the way of the poker player. Go to sleep at four in the morning, wake up at noon is the way it gets. That's my kind of my kind of schedule as well. I love it. Um, All right. So, you know what? Let's let's just break right into it. When we were doing our research for this interview, Evan, um, it was kind of tough to find like, you know, personal stuff about you. So let's just get to know you a little bit about your background, how you first got into poker. I know you've been involved for, it's got to be like 15 years now. So how did you first get your start in the game? And when did you start treating it as more than just a game a little bit more seriously? Okay, so if we just go like way back, I always had like an affinity for cards and for puzzles. Uh, I played cards with my grandmother when I was really young. I spent a lot of time there when I was, uh, you know, a kid. And we would go through the Hoyle's book of card games, that book, and just learn every single book or learn every single game we could. So we played a lot of different card games that really shaped my mind. And also um, when I would visit my aunt and uncle, we would play cards for chores. And if you lost, you had to do chores. And if you won, you didn't have to do chores. And he figured, you know, he's 25 years older than us. The kids don't have a chance, but I kind of figured out the game. And I learned at that age that if I'm really good at the card games, I don't have to work. I like um, <laughs> You learned didn't, early. Didn't, Very good. didn't think that was going to be a real thing and carry through. But sure enough, when um, I went to university first year, poker came around and I said, oh, I know, I, I'm familiar with this game. Okay, we'll try it out. Didn't do so well the first couple of times, but found out they had websites uh, that you could learn some basic tips. And there were books that were out. So I ordered all the books. And, you know, then then after the first year, I, I, ordered, I joined the training sites and I started studying. And it was probably about uh, two years where I was just kind of doing it for fun, playing okay. sit and goes, you know, try to build up 50 bucks to 1,000 and that kind of thing. Uh, but in third year university, I basically um, stopped going to class for the most part. Mm -hmm. And instead of studying the textbooks they were giving us at school, I was studying the poker books. And then when the training sites, Poker X Factor and Card Runners came out, I just started watching every single video. And Mm -hmm. they said, you know, cash games are where it's at. Cash games, cash games, cash games. So I stopped playing sit and goes and I started playing cash games. And honestly, it just took off from there. Wow. I had a background in gaming, you uh-huh. know, like, like it was more like the online role playing games. It was more, I was comfortable playing like 10 hours on the computer a day, 12 hours. Wow. I was comfortable with the slow, steady build, which is what you need to do with a bankroll. And because in those games, you have to click really fast to pick up the items that the bosses drop. Uh, we learned to quick, to click quickly. So for game selecting and getting on good games, ninja clicking, as we call it, right. was very helpful. So I was just the guy who would, you know, get all the tables open, wait for the good seats, hop on the good seats, get the best seats on the table, and then just grind for, you know, six, eight, 10 hours on the cash tables, um, make the money and then um, go back and hit the books. And I'd, I'd watch poker after dark every evening to cross train. I'd watch world poker tour in my off time. I would watch training videos and I'd play online poker. And that was basically my third year university, fourth year university was that. And then I moved out of my parents' house, moved in with my poker buddy. And it was like, you know, 2008 was playing, 2009 I was playing. And um, yeah, then in 2010 or 2010, I transitioned to tournaments mm-hmm. and it wasn't as good because, you know, there's a lot more volatility. Right, of course. But in 2011, 
Uh, I went to Vegas for what I thought might be my last World Series because I was kind of down and out on tournaments. I wasn't really liking that lifestyle. I met Greg Merson. He moved to Canada, spent the year with me, introduced me to all my favorite coaches from like Lego Poker and Card Runners. You know, I'm meeting King Dan and Aaron Jones and Dan Smith. Right. You know, I said Dan Smith, uh, Lucky Chewy in there, and then Tony Gregg. And that just kind of opened my network to, okay, now I have... Um, you know, people who play the game with me, I got some camaraderie. I'm not on my own anymore because right. I noticed that was what kind of set me down. I had a year with no roommate, set me down. Then I got Greggy, met all my poker friends. Um, and then I was just, then I was in love with it again. And wow. uh, I basically grinded super hard with him. We had the World Series run, run where he won the main event and right. I had a little piece and everyone well, else in that fun. crew had a piece. So we're on like the ultimate high of, wow, we watched this on TV with Moneymaker and now it's really happening. And that kind of peak experience that whole summer and, you know, we went through a lot of tough times leading up to it, but that sure. whole thing and then that peak is always etched in my memory because it's such a highly emotionally charged experience that for me... Uh, World Series is where I'd spent time with my friends. That was when I really got to do the thing that I enjoyed the most. So that was kind of me expressing uh, my freedom and joy. And um, yeah, then I just kind of thought, okay, we made a bunch of money now. How can I ensure that I have longevity right. in this industry? And what else can I do that's going to keep me feeling satisfied? Because at some point, money is no longer the motivator. It was for a long time. And at some point, it's not. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, well, I can't just continue to get motivation from just playing. So I need to do other things. So I started making the training videos and right. I started, you know, doing the streaming and getting more and more connection and also bringing more fun. Cause I thought that training videos were kind of boring. So I'm like, how can I make them more fun? How can right. I get even more enjoyment in poker? And that's what kind of blended the passion that I had with kind of sharing it with the world and still also bringing profits into and that's just kept evolving, you know, with different roles being offered and whatnot. That's really fantastic how you find fulfillment first, again, as a player, and then you say yeah. on to the next adventure. Like you said, it's not about the money. It's how do I feel happy at the end of the day? And it's not necessarily just by sitting at the felt, uh, you know, 10 hours a day anymore. It's maybe helping other students learn the game and, and succeed. That, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I was actually speaking to a friend about this last night with regards to money is that, you know, a lot of people say, oh man, if someone's saying that money doesn't matter or money isn't important, that's just someone who, you know, they got lucky and they got all this money. And there's, there's a point where money is extremely important, extremely important, extremely important. And you're kind of getting these returns with it in terms of happiness and utility and what you can do. But eventually there's the diminishing returns where the extra bits of money you get aren't giving you the same level of satisfaction or freedom that the things were before. Sure. And that's when kind of the realization comes in of like, oh, what else is there to this life than just this game of money that was a human construct in the first place? Let me tap in, let me look in and let me see what maybe I sacrificed in the pursuit of pure profit mm -hmm. and what I need to bring into the picture mm -hmm. um, to just to just feel rewarded. And when I, when I, when I got to be a part of that win with Greg, that really showed me, you know, I don't need to be the guy who's winning to get all this enjoyment. Right. And that's what the training videos with Grips really did. You know, when Charlie Carroll came through and started taking off, when Ali Msirovich came through and just took off. And I got to watch these guys win and remember, oh, I remember the first time I had a huge tournament win and how that felt compared to, you know, the third or fourth. I'm like, they're having, I want as many people to have that feeling as they can mm -hmm. and to get to like be there to be like, yo, congrats, man, way to go. How you feeling? Right. And get to, you know, vicariously feel that first time again yeah. and that rise to the top again. So it's fun to get to experience it through other people, which, you know, I'm sure as, as a host for a podcast, you get yeah. a really fun experience with that too, of all these people are excited to share their story. I, I love it. And I, you know, it's very cool to get to meet people in that position because so many poker players, just people in general in the world, we get lost in that search for just, you know, making ends meet, making money, just that sort of a thing. And we get so used to it that we forget at some point you do reach that point of there's other stuff that's important. You could make your rent at the end of the month, you're paying your mortgage. That's already okay. You've got that handled. And, you know, so many professional poker players such as yourself have reached that point relatively early on in life. That's a really cool thing. You know, a lot of people only get there when they retire in their 60s. So that's a really cool perspective to have and a really great life lesson to learn that there's fulfillment to be found in other things beyond just the chase 
for that dollar or Canadian dollar, as it were. So yeah. that, that's that's really good. I mean, you mentioned that Grips, of course, that, that is your nickname, that's the name of your training site. What's the yeah. story behind that name, Grips? Uh, yeah, yeah, so the, the Grips, man, it's just, <laughs> honestly, it was uh, one of those things, uh, my roommate in uni uh, for poker mm -hmm. after university, we, we grew up, you know, in, 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 you know, the, the little hip hop era, right, where all the white boys think they're going to be gangsters because they're listening to 50 Cent and stuff like that. Uh -huh. And so we, we had some slang, you know, from that and from other people who are in the same thing. And one of the things was, was grips. It'd be like, yo, can you go grips me some of this or grips me some of that? <laughs> and one day he came to my house and he's like, hey, man, my girlfriend's giving me a hard time. I'm like, why? And he's like, you know, we were driving. I'm like, let me just grips this parking spot over here. And she said, is that what you're going to do? You're going to grips the parking spot? And I was like, man, screw that, man. Grips is, grips is so cool. I'm going to make grips my new screen name. My new screen name is going to be grips.com. You know, it's going to be the past tense of grips. It's going to be that. So right. it's just like a thing. And then once I had the website as my screen name, I said, well, I might as well do something with this. So I started out by making a text document that explained how Rakeback worked uh -huh. and why, you know, the site I was working with was, was a great site for Rakeback. They had the best numbers. And this right. was kind of when the affiliate game started for me, sure. which has been a real crucial thing. And then it just grew. I'm like, okay, well, I don't just want a text website. So let me hire a web developer. Mm -hmm. and they're like, okay, you're going to need some videos. So I'm like, okay, I'll make a video course. Right. So we can teach people how to play better and then they'll do better when they sign up. And then, you know, we'll, we'll be more successful. And it just kept a evolving but the funny thing is it's so hard to pronounce when you see it for the first time it's not <laughs> phonetically correct right um it's not even a real word no nope. and if i were to you know you know now that i've studied marketing and branding and learned about that if i were to start all over again there's no way that i would choose that as the name it doesn't like i know you know it means like you grips that you grips that pot it's good for like bluffing and stuff like that but the common person is going to have no idea what it means. Mm -hmm. And therefore, like for a brand name, it's a really bad choice. But when you've been <laughs> with something so long and right. it's what people identify you as, and you know, I, I like it. Right. I like it. I, I think it's cool. Um, There's no other grips that anyone would confuse you with. That's for sure. Exactly. No one's going to steal your URL. None of that. So right. you just, you just kind of have to roll with it. And the one thing I thought was because it's a little bit kind of slang or a little bit, you know, we would say like ghetto, right? You grips that, yep. right? I was like, maybe we should have something with a bit more positive association because grips is like take, you know, I'm like, but it is for poker, which a lot of that is, you know, you're, you're trying to take from your opponent. So it makes sense in the space sure. once people know what it means. But prior to that, it's like, what, what the heck are you grip seed, grip said? <laughs> some people, gri some people are like grisped or like, gri I'm like, it's definitely not gripes, but it's, it's it's fun to see how people pronounce it. And um, yeah, yeah, it just kind of, I kind of said it and then we just kind of went with it. And I, I kind of, there was, there was no turning back once I started the YouTube channel really. So 2008, 2009, I was just kind of locked in. Wow. I'm, I'm <laughs> curious. Well, now that, now that you're further down that road, you've studied all the marketing, you know what you know, just off the top of your head, is there a different name or something like that that you would have <laughs> Or that you would choose now in retrospect? You know what? That's that's the thing. I don't really know. Mm. I don't really know because I went down a lot of paths because it was like, oh, I have the website right. or I have the domain. We should make a website. Oh, we have a website. We should make a training site. And there were a lot of times where people were encouraging me to go down paths that in reflection, I'm like, you know, I don't know if I really wanted to start like a whole training site. That's a lot sure, of work. So sure. let's let's make it available mostly for free or very inexpensive mm -hmm. because making videos every day, that's exhausting. I learned that from YouTube. And when people are paying, it's even more pressure. I'm like, I just wanted to have fun playing poker and connect with a community of people who wanted to do the same thing. Right. So I realized I don't think I fully needed a brand and I could have just been Evan Jarvis the whole time and it would have uh -huh. been fine. But you know, you learn, you're like, oh, I need a brand name. Let me come up right. with something. You do all that, like, wait, that's if I want to be a big business. I just want to be like your friendly neighborhood, like <laughs> happy, healthy, helpful poker player, right? Nice. So, and that's why Cards Chat was such a great fit.
Mm -hmm. For you sure. Know? Absolutely. It, uh, you know, your message, the type of things that you're saying, I'm sure that all of our listeners and people watching the show are like, yep, yeah, that's me. That makes sense. That, that's what our audience is all about. Um, yeah. well, you did mention, of course, you know, your website and your YouTube. Um, you know, for those who haven't yet checked it out, Evan's YouTube uh, channel has a ton of free training content. And on there, that series of training videos you mentioned, I think it's 57 videos long uh, on grips.com. Um, how long has that been available, like since you finished creating it? And who would you say would be like the best types of people fit for those videos? Like what's the target audience there of people who should watch that stuff? Okay, so the original playlist was, I think it was originally titled like how to win at poker, or how to play poker like a pro. Mm -hmm. And the way it came into creation was 2008. Um, when I would meet people for the first time, I wasn't super social, but whatever, right. when I would meet people, they'd be like, what do you do? I'd be like, I play poker. They're like, really? Can you make money doing that? I'm like, yes, you can. They, then they say, can you teach me how to make money doing that? I say, yes, I can. They're like, okay, what do we do? And I'm like, well, I can't just sit here and explain it to someone. So I need to have something I can point them to. Right. So I made a bet right. with a friend that this is back when I used to smoke. I said, I bet you over the over a pack of cigarettes, I could uh -huh. teach someone how to win at poker. So basically two hours, you know, you're five minutes per cigarette, whatever it is. <laughs> I said, I bet in two hours I could teach someone how to win. So I said, what do I need to teach them to do that? And so I made the course and we started with bankroll management and money management, because the whole thing in poker is, do you have enough to stay in the game and keep playing? Like mm -hmm. investing in stocks, you're making little bits here and there, but you need to be able to stay in the game. So we started with that. Then I talked about how poker works, which is right. kind of, you know, the, the fight for the blinds and antes and the fight for the pot and the math. And then just introducing, you know, the, the importance of position, uh, the power of aggression and getting the math working for you, selection, Pre-flop play, why people most people get it wrong and what they need to pay attention to. Then little flop play, turn play, river play, how pots grow, and then how to adjust to all the different player types because we need to adjust our strategies based to them. And that course was made, I think we first put it on Grips in like 2008 and the wow. first third was free and then it was supposed to be pay for. Right. And then I think in 2000. 10 mm -hmm. i said forget that we're just going to make that one public on youtube so that right. one's been available for about 10 years mm -hmm. and because all the concepts in it are evergreen and it's more what to pay attention to yep. what to think about anyone who is beginner or intermediate who plays but doesn't necessarily kind of understand the big picture the holistic view of poker yeah i highly recommend it because it only takes a couple hours yeah you can you can go through it real quick and it's just reinforcing what's important to pay attention to. Right. You know? And th that idea, I like that word evergreen that you used and that's so important. And some would say pretty rare, you know, because poker players continuously get better. Strategies continue to get more advanced. You know, so many yeah. pros are even saying it's harder and harder to win. It's really cool that there is something out there, even though it's, you know, over 10 years old, but like you said, it's evergreen. Someone just getting into the game, the concepts are still valuable. The way you described it, it's clearly you get into that poker mindset. It's not, oh, okay, let's, you know, sure, let's have fun, but like yeah. you really have the right frame of mind when you're training in that way and learning those sorts of concepts. So more power to you for putting something out there that certainly has stood uh, the test of time. That, that's some really good stuff. Thanks, Robbie. So, um, yeah, yeah. And, and you use this word holistic, and that actually leads really nicely in to my next question, and I'm going to read something off of your site, actually. Oh, okay. Okay. So besides the free content that we've talked about, the free videos that anyone can just go ahead and watch and start becoming a better player, you also yeah. offer private coaching, right? And I guess you'd call it with a twist, okay? You say it's holistic poker coaching, and here's where yeah. I'm going to read we will dive deep and get to know what your real motivations are for pursuing poker. I will help you dial in on your primary drivers and make a plan with the next steps you should take to bring you closer to living your dream. That's really awesome. I love it. Let's dive in. What exactly does that mean? And when someone hires you for private coaching, how is that different? What does that entail, the work that you do with them? Yeah. So in the, in the two years when I was kind of deciding what I was, what I was going to do, I, I had another moment where I had a couple of big wins 
Um, I had a 33K score online in the Supersonic and 160K score live at my local casino. Yep. And I'm like, okay, I had basically almost all that action. I'm going to take a pause here and figure out what I need to do or what I want to do. Because again, now the motivation for tournaments kind of lulls a little bit. Sure. And I said, I wanted to study. So I took that money and I went to the Shivananda Ashram was where I begun with the studies. And where is I that? started, uh, it's um, Paradise Island in the Bahamas. It's actually right down the beach from the Atlantis where nice. uh, the PCA used to run. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's how I found it. So I started studying meditation, yoga, and there was also some holistic lifestyle coaching because six months before the score, I took my HLC one with Paul Check. And it really got me thinking about the right things. And then, you know, a year later, I'm like, all right, I should take the level two and I should take the level three. So I basically did a whole bunch of trainings to do with yoga, meditation, mindset, massage, uh, nutrition. I was even in nutrition school last year before I was like, I want to get back to streaming. Hmm. And I had all these things. And I said, okay, how, how can I bring this together and offer it? Because I thought... For, for a period, I thought I wasn't going to be back in streaming or back in content creation. I thought I was going to do something sure. different. I said, well, what have I learned? And what kind of feedback am I getting from people? Like, you're a really great listener. You pay really good attention. You're very supportive. And, you know, you, you motivate people to be a better version of themselves. And I said, mm -hmm. okay, I guess we're going to do the life coaching then. Ah, so okay. it was kind of like packaging everything together that I learned from the other uh, modalities mm -hmm. and courses and programs. Um, and then putting it into a package. And what it usually is, is someone will fill out the uh, intake form, which is, is fairly exhaustive and has quite a bit of information. And I even suggest they listen to some binaural beats while they fill out the form, which will help them actually get more engaged. I basically try to bring in all the like um, life hacks that I figured out that can help people perform at a higher level. Nice. They kind of go through the form, you know, what they're, what they're looking for, what they want, what their challenges, fears, frustrations, so on and so forth. And then usually in the first call, we will either identify, I've had this with many people, that poker is not the best path for them to achieve what they're looking for. Hmm. And that in, in many cases, they should stick with what they're doing and that poker is not exactly what they think it is. So there's a lot of reality checks there. And occasionally I'll be like, okay, you, you definitely got this. You're going to crush it. Um, I'll help people with the mental game stuff. And then when it comes to the strategics and the technicals, I'll point them in the direction of, you know, some of the much more advanced coaches in those areas, because that's not the path that I chose to go down. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I learn, I learn from those guys and I try to implement what they teach, but I'm not the teacher of that stuff. I'm not going right. deep with the solvers in that. I'm more about feel your best so you can play your best. Mm -hmm. What are the areas that are draining your energy or sapping your energy or taking your focus or taking your attention that are preventing you from being able to play your A game? Um, and just help people dial in on those right. and drop what's not working. Maybe add in one area that they're missing for some support. And usually it's, it's just a couple of calls. It's usually just a couple of calls because we kind of go through enough that there's so much to work with that the person's like, okay, I'm good. Um, let's check back in in like three to six months. Right. Because personally, I, I really love doing that stuff, but it's, it's a huge thing to take on another person's whole, you know, story right. for a period, help filter it, process it, and then offer some direction, hope that they follow through compared to sometimes when I was doing a lot of that, I'm like, mm, I should be doing more of this work on myself right now. <laughs> and sometimes I'm like, this is great, but yeah. I, I kind of want to be doing the thing that I originally set out to before I got all the additional trainings, which is just, you know, hosting the poker party right. where hundreds of people get to come hang out and we just get to have fun. And it's, it, it doesn't have the same intensity of, okay, we need to fix this, which mm -hmm. is the one thing about coaching is, okay, we're working on stuff and we're fixing stuff. And I've had lots of coaching myself and therapy that helped me through those processes, but the, the vibration of it is a much more intense one. Mm -hmm. And so energetically, there's a limited amount of that that I can kind of handle and do, mm -hmm. um, which is why lately I've much more focused on the streaming and haven't been doing anywhere near as much in terms of the coaching. Right. I have to say, you are, just as an aside, before I even continue, you have a phenomenal vocabulary and you express yourself very eloquently and, and beautifully. I must say that it's, 
you know, I, I find myself just like right here. It's like, wow, I want to just keep listening to what Evan said. It's, it's beautiful. And, you know, it's not like you're a plumber going into a house and looking for more leaks and look, how do I get more money out of this person? I love your approach. Yeah. It's almost like a therapy in a way of how quickly yeah. can I get someone out of here to the next stage, but in a good way. I, yeah. that's, that's really, really cool. And again, and one of those more power to you, because I think the types of things you address Lots of players, when they're at that stage of their pro uh, progress from recreational to semi-pro and pro, they may not be thinking about these things, like these reality checks. Yeah. You know, you're, you're looking out for their better good. You know, if you see that this is not the type of person that a poker lifestyle is good for them, you're shooing them away. No, poker's not. And this is you as a professional poker player is saying that. So that carries yeah. a lot of weight. And I think that's just that's just really wonderful to hear. So... Yeah, I, I, I love it. It's great. Thanks, Robbie. Cool. Um, you mentioned the mental game, right? And of course, you're, you're a big believer, you know, as you just described, the whole holistic approach. Besides improving mental game for your students, what do you do on your own to improve your own mental game? You say you want to work on yourself a little bit more. So what sort of strategies do you use on yourself? And would you say that perhaps these strategies are like universal that can be applied to your students as well, or it needs to be individually tailored. Yeah. Wow. You, you did do good research for this interview. 100%. <laughs> um, okay. Well, I, I have a little bit of assistance. Shout out to Mike. So yeah, we, it's a good teamwork, but yeah. Yeah. Shout out to Mike. Um, if someone's looking for uh, a kind of, if someone's looking for like a complete package, that'll kind of give them uh, everything they, they or, or majority of what they need to get started um, within the poker space. Elliot Rose, a game poker masterclass. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, I worked with Elliot a couple of times. Um, the, the, we'll, we'll talk about that after, but some of the releases that come with that crazy effective. Um, another one that is less expensive, quite good, not as popular of a product. Um, but I thought it was incredible is uh, unchained a powerful mind by Ben CB because oh, sure. he is speaking about similar things to Elliot, but as a professional poker player, right? right. Elliot's a purely a mental game coach and uh, Ben CB is a professional poker player. So just one example was he's like, people think that professional poker players don't tilt. They think they don't <laughs> express anything. Well, I will tell you from having sit beside, you know, Stefan Sondheimer, when he takes a beat, he, you know, yells and gets it out, but then he moves forward, mm -hmm. right? He gets it out and resets. So just a lot of kind of realities and permission to be human coming through. Sure. Um, in terms of specific techniques, I was incorporating both before and after taking those courses. Um, Cause a lot of taking the courses also, I'm doing the research. I want to know what else is out there. And so I can point people in the right direction. Um, okay. So the, the fast track that costs little to no money, binaural beats to access the Delta state for restfulness, which is the opposite of the primary state poker players room, which is going to be much more alpha or gamma hyper-focused kind of state. So Delta helps to reset the nervous system and theta brainwave tracks, brainwave and treatment tracks will help with the creative process for visualization for future planning. Um, these are kind of like super highways to a deep state of meditation for someone who hasn't trained in them where they'll basically kind of snap you to the state. So I right. highly, highly recommend those. They're free ones on YouTube and they're very inexpensive ones from iAwake Technologies. Those were the ones that I kind of discovered first. Mm -hmm. um, meditation itself, extremely important. Tuning out the, even, even, if, even if you don't really understand how it works or what it is, um, if you can just accept that there is value in tuning out the outside world. There is value in getting rid of all external influences that are trying to, you know, reshape your consciousness to their agenda, um, you know, whoever, whatever they are. Right. And then just going inside and paying attention to your breath so that your mind stops reacting to stuff and focus on calming the breath so the mind becomes calmer and the heart becomes calmer right. and the nervous system can heal itself. That is essential and a really good practice to do twice a day, even if it's just for five minutes. I mean, if you think about, I'm a big RPG guy. So if you think about it as you're a character in an RPG, when you go into the meditative state, you're basically going into the inn to get some healing. Mm -hmm. You're getting some healing. And the more time you can sit in that, the more you are repairing, recovering, bringing up your energy bar, your mana bar, your life bar, whatever you want to call it. You know, you're mm -hmm. just get you're powering up 
by unplugging. We don't realize that we're kind of draining our resources slowly and surely when we're in the waking state. And by kind of taking a pause, um, that really helps us to recharge. So that gives us the quick way in, the tool to kind of recharge. Another trick for that is float flotation therapy. Yep. Float therapy. I go to one here in Toronto once a week. It's really fantastic. Um, so those are kind of the inexpensive ones, ways to feel better. Um, eating well, essential. I've experimented with just whatever diet I've experimented with kind of vegetarian. I've expected with pretty carnivore heavy diet. And for me, meat is the way to go. Okay. I just feel best with it with supplements. That's what works for me. Not going to work for everyone. Right. I think it's valuable for people to test what works for them and see what they feel best with. Um, then movement is essential. So for me, the best form is Qigong. It's what movement and exercise. It's like, it's like uh, the precursor to Tai Chi. It's like Chinese oh. healing martial art. Cool. And it's kind of like, it's kind of like the Chinese yoga, we'll mm -hmm. say. And yoga, yoga is great. I love yoga. I'm big into yoga. I've been trained in that. But Qigong is a bit more like flowy. Mm -hmm. And there's a bit more kind of movement to it. And when we do a lot of sitting and we do a lot of hyper focus and we're very tense from the thinking or deadlines or whatever, having just some slow flowing movement is really nice to kind of calm down the nervous system. And these moving meditations are very helpful before the seated meditation. To right. be like, oh, I'm going to sit and meditate after my set. You've just been 12 tabling. Your mind is not ready to stop. You've <laughs> been in fifth gear. You don't just go off the highway, slam the brakes and you're stopped. No, you, you cruise at a little slower pace. And that's where kind of the body movements come in. And I find that from doing, you know, eating well, moving, resting, then, and going inside, then we get the insights of, okay, what's causing me to be stressed? What's causing me to be tired? What's causing me to be this and that? And getting the life inventory is the really powerful thing. So doing a personal check and you know, people do check-ins on their poker game. They, they go through poker tracker and do a leak finder, but they, do they do a leak finder on their life? Do you do a right. review of your life? And a lot of people don't. But if they do, they'll see, okay, is my stress mainly financial? Is it mainly re relational? Is it emotional? Is it, am I thinking? Am I studying too much? Like, am I draining myself there? Is it physical? And if we go through kind of, you know, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, financial, relational, there might be a couple more on the list. I'm not sure. We can check in, okay, where am I a 10? Where am I a two? Where am I a seven? Mm. And find those areas that are twos and say, you know what? I've been working too hard. I haven't been connected with my family. Let me make a phone call. Mm. And it's not, you don't need to redo everything, but you'll, you'll notice the actions that have been ignored. If you kind of have those areas of awareness to look at and say, Oh, okay. I got, I got to, I got to socialize a little more. Or in my case, you know, last year when I was going to school for nutrition, I'm like, you know what? I got to be working more. Right. I've taken too long away from work. I got to start working again. And then I, then I felt really good. Cause I said, um, you know, fight, Income wise, financially, I'm not where I want to be. Mm -hmm. And so what do I need to do for that? Well, I need to work more. Some people are, oh, you can study your poker game more. Yeah, that's one way. Or, you know, there are many alternative ways of generating more income. So by kind of sitting in and quieting down and getting away from say poker for a minute, I can see the other possibilities. Whereas sure. if I'm in poker, I'm kind of just seeing the trees and I'm missing the forest. Yeah. And that's where zooming out and pausing lets us see a whole lot more and say, okay, okay, okay. Let me let let me let me start streaming let me see about getting some sponsorship let me sure. let me continue to make more content for pokercoach.com let me get more active in the form and i'm going to play more too but there are multiple ways i could be doing this and right. so the check in is powerful and the the most so these are kind of in order of operation is how mm -hmm. i would be implementing these things um, then the really 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 big like ultra powerful one um, which, you know, Elliot Rowe is kind of the guy in poker for, but we can go outside of poker to find this. Um, and Tony Robbins is probably the main guy outside of poker. That's the most well-known, but it is the neuro-linguistic programming, mm -hmm. self-hypnosis, working with the subconscious mind kind of stuff. And that's where getting a journal or a book that you can write in is essential because you can kind of write down, you know, what your values are, or you can write down your feelings, your emotions, and then through having the pen and paper, you can converse with yourself and you can converse with your subconscious mind. You can actually see what it's thinking. 
And I have many journals I've done this with. I haven't used it in a while, but you know, I'll kind of write out what's on my mind and then I'll take another color and write, you know, how I would like it to be or how it could be better or just talk to myself the way that a friend would talk to me. So I kind of see I was a mess and then I read the new page. I'm like, okay, everything's clear. So writing is a really good way to sort things out. But until we use the other things to come to that calmer state, we're just going to put a big scribble on the page anyway. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense to kind of work through it. Um, And then once people are in the process of reflection and writing, then it's just choosing the values that work for you. I'm really big on kind of mapping out the dream, the vision, you know, Mm -hmm. what the next three months looks like, what the next nine, what do I really want to achieve in nine months? Who do I need to be more so than what do I need to do to make that happen? Because if I identify who I need to be and program that on the subconscious level, what I need to do is going to happen automatically because there's no resistance. Whereas if I focus on what I need to do, but on a deeper level, I haven't agreed that that's who I need to be or who I want to be. I'm going to have resistance to doing the studying, doing the hard work, putting myself out there, whatever it is. So I like going to who I need to be first. And that is really sitting there, writing it out and just working through that and then kind of making that the core And then all the things that we want, the goals we want to achieve naturally come from choosing, you know, I guess that's what the the choice center is all about. I haven't been, but I imagine that's what it is. Choosing who you want to be, committing to that um, with a huge amount of conviction, and then just kind of watching the ripple effect from there. So, So well expressed. And I have to say, I too am a proponent of a strong mental game, but just the idea of being at peace with oneself, that all of the things in your life are working, uh, like you're doing the types of things that you want to be doing, that you need to be doing, that enables you to have that deep focus at the poker table when you're playing online or when you're talking to a friend or your parents on the phone, like you're focused on that one thing that's an exceptionally wonderful trait to have, but that's by definition disturbed when the other stuff in your life isn't you know, go, going accordingly. I have to say also, I, I already ascribed to this idea of this, this philosophy, but anyone who didn't, they listen to what you just said, you're sold on it. I mean, like you, you make it work. It's not like, you know, with all due respect to 60s hippies and, and pie, it's not pie in the sky. This is very yeah. real stuff. And, and I also have to, you know, shout out myself to Elliot Rowe. I believe this was episode number 20, uh, a past guest here uh, on the Cards Chat podcast as well. And uh, a great time, a uh, good reminder. Uh, our episodes are evergreen too. Anyone who wants to go back after listening to this one and watching episode number 25, we've got 24 other great episodes that we've recorded uh, already. Um, Evan, you mentioned Charlie Carroll, you are uh, Carroll, right? Not Carroll. Yeah, yeah. yeah Charlie Carroll. Charlie and, Carroll, yeah. Right. And Ali uh, Msirovich, those are yeah. two of your most notable students. Uh, they've yeah. been hugely successful at the high stakes games. How did you first uh, meet and hook up with them uh, and begin working with them? So, I mean, that was kind of just the process of putting myself out there. Um, mm-hmm. with, with, with the YouTube channel, I had the core course, but I wasn't really putting work into it. Mm-hmm. And then when I, um, when I kind of had, had a bit of a uncertainty of what I was going to do, Greg Merson had moved home. And mm-hmm. so I had new roommates and they were tournament players instead of cash players. And I was just feeling a little weird, lost and confused. I'm like, what do I need to do? I don't know. I'm like, what, what, what has been working for me for sure? that I enjoy that isn't causing me stress right now because hmm. poker was kind of just, it, it had a lot of tension around it. Sure. So I said the YouTube videos. So what I did in 2013 was I started watching Eric Thomas. Uh, How bad do you want it is, is his thing. And, and he, I just saw him going through his process of making videos of his transformation, sharing principles. And I was also watching Hodge twins and they had their Q and A videos. I said, I could do Q and A videos. So in 2013, I decided to make a series called Project Get Me Stacking, which I think may be one of the ones that you were referencing, where people could send in a question and I would respond to it and make a PowerPoint presentation. That one's probably got up to close to 100 videos now. And it was really helpful for me because it forced me to be able to express my knowledge more succinctly. And anything I didn't know, I needed to go and do more research. And it also showed, my, showed me to myself, oh, I know what I'm talking about. You know, there are Mm -hmm. periods in life where we have a lot of doubt and sometimes we need to do work that we know we can do well to be like, okay, I know what I'm talking about as opposed to learning something new, which can make us feel less confident. And from making those videos, 
Um, the, the guys like Charlie just found the videos. Ali nice. found the videos. Because the thing is, I was the guy on YouTube who was getting all the keywords for poker. Because I was making, <laughs> I, I was, you know, titling them well, but also I was making videos like two, three times a week. And YouTube really favors that in the algorithm. And then I said, you know what? We need to be connected. So maybe... I think it was when we hit a million views on the channel mm -hmm. and maybe it was like 30 videos into the series. I made a video called how to reach your full potential. And it was basically a, a breakdown of all the different study methods and how to make the most of them. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, I said, you know, the, the most, one of the reasons I teach is because it's the best way to learn. And the next best way to learn is for us to be discussing with each other. So let's start a study group on Skype and whoever wants in can come into the study group. Mm -hmm. And Charlie was one of the guys who joined the study group amongst, amongst a bunch of other people. And what Charlie would do, he was the most active guy in the group. Ah, awesome. And he would just be playing all the tables and then he'd let everyone in the group watch him play through like screen share. And he was getting, and then afterwards he'd be like, any questions you guys have, post them in Skype. And he would answer the questions. So he basically took awesome. the study group and ran with it. Yeah. He he watched the party poker bankroll challenge where I started with 100 and put it to 10,000. That was the first challenge before Project Get Me Stack in. And then I think I went back to it to finish it. And he's like, okay, this is how you multi table. This is how you use a HUD. This makes sense. And then he just started playing. And then he kind of took over the group and I just kind of sat back and watched. And <laughs> then he kind of took off. And our connection was in 2015. I invited him to stay with me in Vegas with, you know, uh, Greggy and Tony, uh, Taylor Von Kriegenberg, Randy Liu, and some other guys. Because I said, you know, right now, the level of mind you guys are on, Charlie, Carol, and Ben Heath, you would get so much from talking to these guys. I want to connect you with these guys. Mm. And I'm just going to kind of hang on and do my thing. But I feel like this would help you take off to the next level. Um, and, you know, they, they kept working on their game. They all, they all helped each other. And, and that worked out. And then with uh, Ali, well, actually, the best part about Charlie was, I think it was a year after we started Project Get Me Stack, and I went to Australia, because that was my dream to go play the Aussie Millions. That was my reason for quitting cigarettes. It was my reason for getting sober, and I went and did all that. I love it. And my first weekend there, I was playing the Sunday Million, and I made my deepest run ever. And with two tables left, I think I was the chip lead. And Charlie was in second. And I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. So we did our first swap for like 10%. Nice. I think I got two outed back to back and went out like 17th or 16th, but he went on to win it. <laughs> so, so now we had this. Run good, good, run good. And, good and, and he took the money and he took all the people from the study group on a trip to Amsterdam. Oh my God, that's incredible. What a great and, story on its own. Wow. Yeah. So like that was the camaraderie of like, okay, this is what this community is creating much yeah. like the cards track me where it's like, we're here supporting each other. I'm like, I'm in the right group. And then with Ali, he sent me an email uh, when I was in Machu Picchu. Um, or this was just before I went to Machu Picchu, but I was in Peru and I'd started this series. Where I'm like, okay, I want to start getting good at tournaments. So we're going to do tournament reviews. You guys send me your hand reviews and I will review them, right? And it's a great learning method for me. I'm sharing info, everyone's benefiting from, and the winds keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger from starting mm -hmm. this process. And Ali uh, emailed me, he said, hey man, I just won uh, the Bavada main event for like 37K. Do you want to review it? I said, I'd love to. I'm kind of in Peru right now doing some things. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, I'll write you when I'm back in two weeks and for sure, we'll, I'll review it for you. And he's like, cool, cool, cool. Then I get an email two weeks later when I'm mm -hmm. about to hop on the plane to fly home. And he said, hey, it's me again. I just want to let you know that I won the, the 200K on Bavada again. Oh, Do my God. Review it. <laughs> and I, I said, you know, I'll, I'll review the first one, but I don't know if I have the time to do both. So how about you review the second one and I'll review the first one. But listen, when I get home, let's connect on Skype and let's start talking because you know clearly he had all the potential and he's reaching out so we started talking on skype we started talking strat i kind of gave him my kind of old man wisdom and he gave me the young gun wisdom so he's helped me with my poker strat to stay sharp i've helped him with kind of you know just the bigger picture and how yeah. to carry oneself in the industry and when i did uh, my first kind of live seminar 
uh, for America's Card Room at the Punta Cana Poker Classic in 2015. So I think it was a year later. Yeah. He was one of like four people who actually came to Punta Cana to meet nice. me, nice. to do, to, to sit in for that for like two hours a day. And he brought his parents. So he introduced me to his parents. You know, mm -hmm. we spent the week together, lots of talks. And then just kind of since then, we really became buddies. Um, we try to hang out kind of twice a year, whether he comes here, or I go to Vegas where he's at. Whenever I'm in this series, I make sure I go out of my way to go see him because he's just grinding nonstop. So I'm like, I'm only going to see him if I go there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we, we always check in and we always talk and just, I've, I've try to watch every big run on, uh, you know, poker go. Yep. I've, I've flown out for the super high roller, but like I try to be there when I can. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we've just from spending that extra time together, right. and not just talking poker, but, you know, going for bike rides and walks, just talking about life. And, you know, like he told me, he just bought his parents a house. And I'm like, you have the, the like the best value system, like for, for someone in poker, I'm so impressed. Like he inspires me every time I talk to him, we've just grown to be really good friends. And it was more of a kind of unofficial kind of, I mentored him a little bit in how to take care of himself amongst many other mentors, I'm sure. And he's, he's actually been the one in the last year who's kept me really sharp on my games. He's like, this, this is how people are playing, man. That's what you need to know. You, more this, you, more, you probably want to play on this. I'm like, damn, you're just, you're just killing it. He's like, that, right. that would be an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love, I love that. You know, poker is so much more than just the game. It really just gives you these, at least the potential. If you want to take it, it's there for these life experiences and develop to develop, you know, meaningful friendships. I know that's something that I have from all my home game buddies over the last couple yeah. of decades. It's it's really, really one, a couple, no, not that long, a decade and a half, but it's still, uh, that's just really wonderful. Um, I want to get into also some of the uh, coach, the, the playing that you've done. Okay. Right. Can I add one, can I add one point to the Please last do, one? Of course, I, sure. I just forgot to mention that um, just to kind of show the experience and the, and the, the full circle of it. So like, you know, Charlie winning that Sunday million and giving me a share kind of covered the rest of my Aussie millions trips where I could fire all the buy-ins that I wanted to. And it was nice to have that kind of support with each other, mm -hmm. but probably the, the highlight of my career, other than, you know, my biggest win definitely has to be one of the highlights at my mm -hmm. local casino. That's pretty cool. Right. Greg Merson winning the main event, probably number one, pro probably going to be number one the whole time, just getting to be there and be a part of that. But yep. the next biggest one was actually two years ago um, at the Global Poker Awards oh. when Ali was nominated for Breakout Player of the Year. Yes. And I'm like, for sure he's going to win. And I told Sarah Herring like two years before, this is the guy, watch him, he's going to do it. You know, I told Ali before, I'm like, you know what Charlie did? Like, you're going to be the next try. It's like, I'm going to be bigger and better, man. So I was <laughs> kind of plant those seeds. And when he was nominated for that, I'm like, I'm going to Vegas. And wow. I didn't know it was an invite only. So I'm like, Sarah, can you like get me a ticket? She's like, yeah, we'll see what we can do. And I got to be there for the Global Poker Awards. I think I was at Negranu's table, which was really fun. Instead of Ali's table, which is where I should have been because they kind of didn't know <laughs> why I got there. But getting to see him win the award for Breakout Player of the Year and getting to be there and get to hang out and party and with everyone, all that, I said, this is why I started making those YouTube videos wow. 15 years ago. And I didn't even know back then that that's when I started, but this is why. So when I saw I was nominated, I said, I'm going to Vegas. I don't care what it costs. I don't care if I'm just flying in and then flying out after. I want to be there for that moment because unlike the tournaments where maybe you'll win, maybe you won't, I know you're winning this award and this is a big deal. And wow. um, it was just, it, you know, it's, it's like, you know, you're like, like a proud dad, you're a proud coach. I'm like, he did it. He made yeah. it. I want to be there for that moment. And that's, that's, that's been the best moment of the last like two years. So I just, I just wanted to include that because it's really special and it's a highlight that can only come from connecting with the community and not it's, just sitting there grinding. I love that you added that because that was, believe it or not, the next question was, you know, your proudest <laughs> accomplishment, uh, you know, and that, that's really cool. And it, I think also it just, it says so much about you, the way you speak so glowingly and so highly of like a life high that you had, but it wasn't through something you did. It's through something mm -hmm. you can get so much joy and pride and fulfillment out of seeing someone else succeed. That's an incredible thing. It's an incredible level of humanity to reach. So that, that's just really awesome, man. That, that's good stuff. 
Um, I do have to talk a little bit about what you've done at the Felt also. Uh, okay. One pretty darn cool accomplishment, reaching the money in the WSOP main event four years in a row. How, I mean, that's got to be, I mean, I never played in it, but even reaching the money once out of a field of, you know, six, seven, eight thousand people, sometimes that's hard. Four years in a row, that's pretty tough. How does that feel? And were, were there any differences from year to year uh, in, in, in making the money like that? Um, so the, the first year was definitely the year I felt the best because that's when I had uh, first discovered kind of, you know, the secret, the law of attraction, the power of intention through an audio program called Your Wish is Your Command by Kevin Trudeau. Mm. And the whole the whole model of it, you know, it just seems so ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So we seem kind of like a scammy idea. So we started jokingly calling them the scam tapes. But I listen to those <laughs> scam tapes every day. And I said, if these things work, then I'm going to win the main event. That's what I'm choosing as my primary focus. Let's see. And so that summer, I genuinely believed that I was going to win the main event. And so I played my wow. best poker and it was only on day three, I think, when we were out on a smoke break, because this was the year before I quit smoking. Mm -hmm. uh, Greggy came up to me and he's like, hey, man, I'm like, yo, what's going on? He's like, how's it going? I'm like, it's going good. What's up? He's like, you know how you, um, you know how you like want to like think you're going to win the main? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to win. He's like, I don't, I don't know how to break this to you, but like, <laughs> I've got this feeling like I'm actually going to win. And I was like... <laughs> Well, fuck. I mean, you just want a bracelet in the 10K6. Right. When I'm walking around the house and I'm going to win the main event and he's sitting there laughing at me, 24 tabling, being like, you think that's going to win it for you? This is what's going to win it. Um, when he told me that, I said, well, you know, I guess, you know, I have, I have 2% of you. So <laughs> that's kind of like me winning. So, you know what? I get like, okay, I, I guess like, okay, you're going to win. Okay. Right. <laughs> you can make and your peace with that, right? <laughs> I made my peace with that. That was the year I made it the deepest. I think I made it day five before I busted. Okay. Um, and then the every kind of year, I think it's because the first year I played the main, I cashed it. I ran well and I cashed. I made day five the first year I played in 2008. Mm -hmm. And so I always had in my mind like, ah, oh, the, the, the main event is my tournament that kind of makes my year, saves my year, whatever. Mm. And so I kind of would plan my, my other years around doing well in the main, you know, like where I'm staying, who I'm staying with, if anyone... Um, all my focus kind of went into that tournament and I really focused on, um, having enough stamina to get through the days because I knew how long they were. Sure. Now, when I cashed it the second year and the third year and the fourth year, like each year it became more important that I cashed it because I was going for Ronnie Barda's record of five. Right. And each year it became more, less about winning and mm -hmm. more about cashing. And so, you know, I cashed with some very small stacks in the third and the fourth year, but I actually cashed now because I thought it would be really a cool accomplishment. And, you know, people say good for the brand to get, you know, right. something, get a record or whatever. So I made that my focus, but in retrospect, mm. it, was, it was super stressful the fifth year because the pressure was on and I, I kind of blew it there in retrospect. I probably would have done slightly better if I didn't think about this artificial goal mm. about cashing and just focused on playing to win. Because in that tournament, yes, I mean, cash is great. It's fifteen, twenty thousand dollars. It's huge, but the potential uh, in the top spots is so much more right. that I probably would have been better off to focus on just playing to win rather than this goal that I created. But it goes to show the power of goals yes. that when you set a goal and you make it important you will not do other things that may be in your best interest because they aren't directly correlated to the achievement of that goal. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was, it was really enjoyable each year, more stressful each year. It was always fun making the review vlogs of being yeah. like, hey, we're one step closer, we're one step closer, one step closer. And the year that uh, I bricked it, it's, <laughs> it's really weird. Um, I almost like didn't want to deal with the pressure. And so the night before I, I stayed up with a girl that I'd met down there uh, at a Kundalini yoga class, super cool girl, super fun. But I stayed up to like 2 a.m. And every other year, you know, I'm like, I got to be in bed at 10 or 11, meditating and all that. And then just as like a sign that it, it wasn't meant to be, mm -hmm. the day before I played day one, that morning, 
they were they brought out the buzz saws at the property we were at to chop down the like coconuts on the trees no. Oh, no. and i'm like getting like no sleep and i'm like i don't know if this is gonna work out <laughs> i'm playing in so a 10k I, tomorrow <laughs> yeah so i showed up and i played and i think i i think i made day two and i just mm. you know didn't didn't play my best but i wasn't at my best but something in me mm. kind of sabotaged me to not go for it so there was some part of me on a deeper level that wasn't in alignment with that yet mm -hmm. and i was always thinking well i just had my biggest score ever i'm having a great year i don't know if i actually need this this streak but also part of me was they probably think on a deeper level i don't know if i could handle the attention of you just got a world record of five in a row so i definitely self-sabotaged myself in the last year and i have all my justifications for it and i right. still had one of my best summers ever in a way that was different than mm -hmm. trying to chase results because you know I had such a good time with my friends and the For girl sure. and sure. everyone that summer and it kind of opened me to the bigger picture mm -hmm. but uh yeah it, the, <laughs> the intensity each year was crazy and just like oh my god it made the bubbles and like the day threes like so intense I'm like hey man like I just gotta <laughs> lay low and just like sneak no one else knows I'm going for a right. record here so right. like exactly. they, they won't adjust but like I'm, I'm just I'm just knit it up because I really right. just want to <laughs> <laughs> I want to see my name next to Ronnie. Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, it's a definitely a rare question to be able to ask. So it's always interesting to hear the that that multi year journey. Um, yeah. We've got a bunch of questions from the Cards Chat community that we want to let's, ask you, but one that we always ask our guests first to start out is you know this is you know the friendliest poker podcast in town. Can you name off the top of your head maybe one or two of the friendliest players you've ever faced at the felt? Uh, Lucky Chewy. It's uh, Andrew Lichtenberger, right? Yeah. Andrew Lichtenberger. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there there was one time he he, he three bet bluffed me, but I mean, it's poker. You're supposed to do that. <laughs> you but, always but remember I, that but, one time. <laughs> but I had aces, so I didn't fold. And I got, I'm like, you're trying to you're trying to three bet bluff me in the main. You ain't even got nothing. But you're just playing this game. Next, oh, next friendliest, 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 friendliest. Um. Oh, I mean, it'd probably be I'm trying to think of like the poker celebs that I got across passes. I didn't ever get to play with him, but I got to meet him many times. Mike Saxton was the man. Mm, Mike beautiful. Saxton yeah. was just like the best personality. And when I when I listened to his autobiography too, like just it just made me love the guy even more. Yeah. He he had the best personality, so friendly, so well spoken, such good energy. I'm sure at the table it would have been similar. Uh, I would yeah. have I would have to put Mike at the at the top there. Love for it. Sure. Great answer. So, certainly someone universally beloved, uh, you know, by yeah. the community. Uh, Mike, rest in peace, sir. Um, so we're going to turn to the part of the show uh, where we do ask you guys who are watching, who are listening in the Cards Chat community, what questions you wanted to ask our guests. And of course, uh, every time we have uh, a new booking announced, we've got someone coming up. We let you guys know there is a dedicated thread on the Cards Chat forums where you can submit your questions. Uh, we'll try to get through as many as we can here in the time that we've got remaining. So first one is Crystals. Crystals, thank you so much. You put a bunch of questions here. Uh, let's see what we can ask. Um, oh, okay. Here's an interesting one. From, they're all interesting, but here's one I find interesting. What do you see as a more profitable path in the future, playing or coaching poker? Um. Well, again, I was kind of saying to a friend of mine last night, similar thing. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think if okay. you are coaching, you have to be playing. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of which one will generate more income, like they're, they're just completely different <laughs> skill sets. Like, yes, yes. Coaching, um, you, most players who can play can coach. But mm -hmm. to run a successful coaching business, is extremely different than a successful business as a player. For sure. So as a player, if you have a strong understanding of the game, you're really good with math, you're really good at um, you know, rising to the occasion, dealing with pressure, managing yourself, you're gonna make more money from poker. If you are good at branding, mm -hmm. communication, listening, motivation, managing others, giving honest feedback, doing deep reflection, you're going to make more money from coaching, but two different things. And it's like the individual needs to look at their skill set 
to decide which would be more lucrative. Now, if the question is asked to me, mm -hmm. which is going to be more lucrative, coaching or playing, I believe the answer is actually going to be neither. Oh. Because for me, the most lucrative thing will be, and probably always has been, with the exception of the tournament scores, which kind of adjust the graph sure. a little bit. Of course. Um, affiliate marketing and working with partnerships. Huh. I do, I've done, a, I started in the affiliate game um, um, when I was starting cash games, when I made that transition. And that's when I realized, you know, because I watched a lot of, um, all advantage was, you know, get paid to surf the internet. When that came out, I was on that. Yep. I'd watched the MLMs and I, I wasn't really into it, but it, it made sense that if you could sell, you, you can make money. And so for me, I'm bigger on sales. Mm -hmm. I love the game. I love to play. It's super fun. When people watch my stream, they know that I absolutely love it. But my strongest skill set is more to do with sales, mm -hmm. marketing, and mm -hmm. finding good partnerships and building good relationships. So for me, you know, um, you know, working with ACR as a stormer and hopefully a team pro soon, that there's a good chance that the money from playing, it's going to be hard for it to top that. It might be close, but it's going to be hard to top that, especially you know with selling action tournaments and whatnot. Sure. And just the other thing is with affiliate marketing. I mean, you have all these streams of passive income. Yeah. You know, I have partnerships with poker coaching and raise your edge and run at once pretty much all the training sites. And, you know, you get some income, you wake up in the morning, you had some income coming in. While Good we're having feeling. this conversation, <laughs> there might be some income coming in. So because I have done those and worked on those streams for 13 years and, and more intensely in the last three years, it's very hard for me as an individual to be able to generate more than basically you know, five to 10 different workhorses that are running around the clock that sure. are already moving at a high speed. Kind of the same with, you know, when someone has invested quite a bit and their portfolio is doing well, it's very hard for them as an individual to out outperform and out earn the portfolio because, right. you know, you're competing against, you know, 10,000 or 50,000 or 100,000, you know, workers, and you're just one person. Of course. So I think in terms of the order, it would be, you know, my, my sponsorships and affiliate marketing and just partnerships, basically like real work, right? you know, to right. me, like the coaching, making videos and doing all that and being active, that's my real job. Uh -huh. It always has been. Um, professional poker is right there with it because mm -hmm. I've done quite well with it, but it was never my sole source of income, which is why I was able to have a lower stress level and able right. to kind of have a bigger picture perspective. For sure. Um, I would put the poker at number two and then individual coaching for me would probably be the lowest on the rung because I don't do anywhere near as much of it. And a lot of times I do coaching now, it's just a uh, kind of a free trade with someone I like, oh, basically just having nice. a conversation where I'll mix some of that in and they'll mix some of theirs in, but it's not generating hard income. Sure. Um, so that's what I'd say, but always for an individual who's choosing, look at your skill set and see which kind of avenue within the industry matches your skill set. And that's how you'll determine, you know, should I be a yeah. player? Should I be a coach? Should I be an ambassador? Should I just be a streamer? Like there's a reason I stream more and don't make a lot of YouTube videos right now because video editing, producing, not so much my thing, but live conversation, I absolutely love it. So yeah. okay, live streaming, is the fit. Right, right. So. You're certainly good at it. I must say, it's a great spot to be in. Um, and, you know, just in life in general, it seems, you know, you've got your, your head on your shoulders and it's a, it's a great, good, complete answer to that one. I like it. Um, Rowdy Greg, another forum member, asks this question, Evan, what was your major at university and did that help you at all with poker? Yeah, so my major at university, and I did get my degree. I wasn't going to much class at the end, but I was pretty good, good at cramming and studying and <laughs> memorization and, you know, BSing my way through the, the papers. <laughs> but, you know, we got it done. Yep. Um, my, my original major was business. Um, and then I didn't do well enough in first year to stay in the business program. So I dropped down to an economics degree. And so I got a general economics degree. In terms of it helping... Um, the money management element of economics mm. certainly helped me. I think I learned that more in high school, but my high school, I went to a private school, um, Upper Canada College, and our last two years of high school were basically like first year university. So they kind of got us ahead of the game. So what I learned in economics was super helpful. And what I learned in mathematics prior to uh, was very helpful. 
And the, the course in university that was most useful, I guess, actually there were two. Uh, since we're talking poker, game theory was a helpful course Ooh, for poker. That's a good but, one to take, yeah. But the course that helped me the most in my life was a course called Interpersonal Communication. There's a course like that? There wow. was a course called Interpersonal Communication. Wow. one of the electives I took. And at the end of the course, we got to do a presentation on anything. <laughs> and I made a presentation. I, I think I was starting to make the video. I made a presentation on grips.com. No. And, <laughs> and it was, it was, a, it started with a video That's of me amazing. getting in a hundred big blinds at three, six with pocket aces versus Kings and him hitting a King and me losing and be like, most people would quit when this happens, but I don't. Cause this is just part of the game. And wow. here's my website where I explain the correct mindset for poker and how you can be successful at poker and how I've been successful at poker during university. And you can too. And that was my presentation, but I always got feedback yeah. when we did a presentation or if there was a group project that we had to make something and pitch it, I would always just be the pitch guy. Right. I would just be the salesperson. And so the feedback was always, you know, you're, you're a great talk. You could sell cars. You could sell whatever. <laughs> I'm like, I don't want to do that. But um, that's probably what got me to my real place in the, in the industry, which is right. more, you know, frontline communication stuff as opposed to just like backline grinding. Well, you certainly get an A plus for creativity, finding a way to do that in a college course. You know, that's, that's, I love that. That's an amazing story. Uh, yeah. what, we have time for two more questions here. One from Shells, who so kindly yeah, always puts yeah, some yeah, great yeah. questions forth. Um, away from poker, not poker related, Evan, what are your hobbies? Um, is this during COVID or pre-COVID? However you'd like to answer this question. I'm a little more <laughs> limited. Um, during COVID, where I'm much more limited, I like uh, <laughs> I like going for long walks by the lake. That's a good answer. And it's important to get out of the house and away from the screens. I tell my kids that all the time. Please tell yeah. me about the lake. <laughs> yeah, I, I, so, so I live right on Lake Ontario. It's always oh. been my favorite place. The lake really settles my soul. It settles everything. So after my long grinds, I go for walks by the lake or my days off, I'll just drive to a park and go for a nice walk there. Mm -hmm. um, so I really just like going for walks in nature. That's fantastic. Beautiful. Um, other, other hobbies, I really enjoy good music. I'm not someone who knows all the artists and knows all the songs, but I really appreciate good music. So when yeah. someone gives me like a good like house set or something, I'm just all about it. So I love driving while the sun is out, reflecting, glistening over the water, because I think it's the most beautiful sight. Windows down, breathing in that fresh air, listening to some incredible house music. Or I feel that right if I now. want, <laughs> yeah, or if I want to be a bit more chill, listening to some like sacred like mantra, like kind of holy music that is really soothing for the soul. With that sun at glistening, my favorite. Um, oh my goodness. Wow. If we're talking non COVID, right. Uh, I'm big into self care. So like, I mean, massage is my go to and I'm getting back into I was about to take up squash before they closed the gym. Mm. I played a couple of times. I said, this is amazing. This is going to be I used to play tennis, but I stopped a long time ago and I stopped all sports. So I think I'll get back into that. Um, and then yoga, qigong, swimming. Oh my God, the, the gym has a rooftop pool that has a panoramic view of the city and I can't go because it's closed. I'm just waiting for it to come back because I love a nice view and like just some nice water or a hot tub and just 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 kind of lounging out in the outdoors, man. That's, hey, that's, you've that's certainly it. given me some wanderlust and <laughs> I got to get out there. I got to find myself a lake and watch a sunrise. Um, yeah. Last question here is from... I pronounce this right, Chavis, uh, C-H-A-V-I-I-S. I've never seen that name before, so thank you very much for submitting this final question of the podcast for Evan. Um, and I think this is a good way to sort of end off. I know so many folks uh, in the Cards Chat community, they're new. They're just starting on their poker journey. Maybe they don't necessarily have those dreams of becoming a high roller or winning the main event, but they just want to have a good time and, you know, have this as a long-term hobby. Mm -hmm. Evan, can you tell us, this is a question, which, which was your biggest achievement in poker when you were a beginner player? Oh, here I was thinking he was going to ask, what are the best resources to get started with for free? Um, ah, the biggest, we'll, get, we'll get that at the end. You'll have plenty the, of opportunity to plug stuff. But yeah. the, big, the, biggest, the biggest achievement when I was a beginner player. Um, I feel like whatever you're going to say is something that could potentially resonate big time with people who may not 
go so far on the path, but may stay at that one, two level. Like myself, I'm still at the one, two level. So what do you consider yeah. like an achievement? Um, I guess I'll throw, I guess, you know what? All right. I, I have three and they're all pretty short, but they okay. all hit different areas. Okay. The first one was after the first Christmas break of university, when my, my main poker buddy, my best friend and I really studied, we read a bunch of articles and we learned how to bet properly. Hmm. And I went back to school and we played our weekly sit and go that we always played. It was the highest stakes one we'd ever played because it was after Christmas. And instead of playing for five or 10, we played for 20 bucks and it was 10 people. And I was using the new betting, you know, the proper betting. And they nice. were all like, what's going on? Like, how, why are you betting so big? Da, da, da. I'm like, fractions of the pot, whatever. And then just, just smoking everybody. Nice. After I had studied and been like, this is a beatable game when I do my research. And I bought myself a pair of Perry Ellis shoes that I still have <laughs> to this day. I love because it. Because I'm like, I won those by, by applying my mindset and my study and like, I deserve something nice for this. So that was kind of my first symbol. That felt great. Great answer. Um, Good. Yeah. First time I went to play one, two at the casino after playing lots of online and having a sharp game Ooh. and building a stack up from like, I don't know, 200 to 600 and getting all in with a straight against two pair for... I don't know, maybe a $700 pot mm. and, and, and him, him getting there and me losing the pot and him mm. being like, what did you have, man? I'm like, I had the freaking straight. If you really need to know, like you got lucky and getting to still book a win of, you know, maybe a hundred dollars having had a very good chance to be up 1300. And again, having that confidence of I'm the best player at this. T- it's my first time playing live poker at this casino but I'm better than all you guys because I know that the work I've done before mm. has, has me as a big advantage. So that confidence that came from that, just feeling the confidence of knowing I was the best player at the table was huge. And then in terms of like scores, cause everyone's excited when they get their little binks here and there. Sure. Um, I was grinding 50 cent a dollar. I was super nitty with bankroll management. And I think there was some affiliate money there too. I'd built up my bankroll to like, 20k something absurd i was still playing 50 cent a dollar because i'm like no i want to be sharp like i don't want i'm not ready for one two but you know i'd mix in some tournaments so i played they had this 1k tournament it was a six max 1k two-day tournament called the grand tournament on poker room and it was all branded nice like that looks exciting poker room wow (laughs) yeah (laughs) that was my site but there's no way i'm gonna buy in so i played a five dollar rebuy satellite to it and I was in for 15 bucks, you know, one rebuy, one add on the min, won the seat to the 1K, mm. played the 1K six max, which was crazy for me because I was a 10 handed player and super nitty. So that's not suited for six max. But fortunately, there were no antis on the site back in the day. So I didn't need to play too <laughs> loose. Yep. And I applied everything I'd learned from backs and sheets and I ran well. And on the bubble, I was opening every hand. I even opened seven deuce off suit on the bubble and they all fold. <laughs> and one of my buddies is like, How are you doing that? Like, you're playing crazy. And made day two. Played super nitty, got really short, doubled when I needed to, really short, made it to the final table of six with like a third of what fifth place had, you know, like so short. Wow. Um, I think I got it in good ace king against ace 10 and lost, but it didn't matter because I was so short, you know, I needed to get there. But the score was $20,000, which doubled my bankroll. And I got it off a $5 satellite for 15 bucks. So even though I'd followed super strict bankroll management, this shot gave me this break and I'm like, okay, so again, the extra work pays off, but it's good to be responsible with my money. And you know, I got that 40K, you know what I started playing? One, two. One, one there two. you go. One, two. One, two. And I didn't, I didn't go to two, four, I think until I had 60K and I'd proven I could beat one, two, because for me, I wanted to feel, I always had low self-confidence in life. I always felt like I wasn't as good as the other kids because sports were praised or music was praised or, you know, other things were praised. And even in like theater where I was a good performer, I was always, you know, the second guy. I would never get the lead role. I would always be the second guy. So I always had low self-confidence. But with poker, here was a game where I felt confident. My abilities were there and I was actually getting rewarded. People thought it was cool. And so for me, the most important thing in poker was feeling confident. And so there was no rush to get to stakes because it wasn't about making the most money for me. It was about doing something that I felt comp- felt good about 
that I knew I could do well and that made me feel confident. And so that's why I kind of follow just the solid bankroll management, always put myself in the best spots. Because if I feel confident, I'm going to enjoy the game and I'm going to have longevity. I'm never going to have these really dangerous big losses that can come from taking too many shots. And so each of those stories kind of were moments where I felt the peak confidence, like, yo, I got this. I'm yep. the man. Like I got, I'm, I'm, I'm number one for a minute. This is cool. Yeah. And you've, I think you've given us all hope, you know, like you don't have to be the high roller, you know, throwing 10 Ks everywhere, even playing 1500s, even for those small buy-ins when you're at the beginning of your poker journey, there's so much success that can be had. Those are phenomenal stories, Evan. And I want to just thank everyone who sent in questions from the community for uh, Evan Jar Jarvis. Of course, uh, a friendly reminder to everyone in the community. We'd love to see you submit your questions for our future podcast guests. Be sure to check out the dedicated thread in the forums. And of course, we always like, if you enjoyed this show, to please give us a good review on iTunes and spread the word via your social media channels. Uh, Evan, before we let you go, here's your chance. Plug away. What would you like to tell our audience before we go? Okay. Um, if someone is looking for free poker training and to level up their game, uh, grips.com forward slash free is the page. And if you scroll all the way to the bottom, we have a cash game program and a tournament program. Both of them are available for free and you'll get um, about 10 hours of training in curated playlists and some premium material, premium material in both of them. And I just highly recommend them because they have that cash course I mentioned, and I have a 10 part tournament course that just teaches how to approach the things. And it's a really good foundation to get, and it's free. So for people wanting to learn, I think that's kind of the best resource alongside the cards chat course, which is fantastic as well. Um, and then for anyone who wants to connect with me, the best way really is to just drop by my Twitch stream. I stream, I finally have a schedule. I've always avoided schedules, but I've finally grown up and <laughs> developed a schedule. So every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, uh, usually starting at noon Eastern time and go until 10 p.m., sometimes midnight, um, I have a stream. And we have three home games, which I invite you guys to. We have a free buy on Fridays, which is 5 p.m. starting time, Eastern time, two hours of late reg, free to play with $3 rebuys and 250 added to the prize pool. I was inspired by the Cards Chat Sunday tournament with 100 out. I'm like, this is great. Let's get more of these. We have a Friday game for that. On Saturdays, we have a high roller, which is $12 to play. It has a $95 ticket added to the winner. And what's cool is we simulate the Venom structure. So you get 300K chips, six minute blinds, super deep. You're gonna have millions of chips by the end, it's super fun. And then on Sunday, we have just a 220 home game at 5 p.m. with one hour late reg, unlimited re-entry. And the reason we have these three games that's important to have all three, I just got permission to run a league um, and, you know, we have, we have a thread going in poker news and events that I'm going to update. Tammy helped me with it. Uh, we're going to run a league for 12 weeks. Each of these three games awards points in an equal manner. And if you're hearing about the league late, don't worry. Month two, we have 1.5 X multiplier month three, we have two X multiplier on the points. So it's not too late to get in, but the top nine people at the end, will get to play a one table sit and go for a 2650 venom ticket. And the winner gets to play for 50%, second and third get 10%, and everyone else gets a 5% sweat. So it's, again, a team thing. We all play in the league together. We got this added money, and at the end of it, someone gets to play in the tournament where they can win a million bucks. And I'm just, I'm just really excited to have that up and running. And it's kind of the, the, main, the main feature during the streams. You know, I play, then we play together, and then we'll play something high stakes at the end for fun. And it's just a super fun party. It's a no delay stream. So you guys can actually get direct live interaction with me. You don't need to wait five minutes for a response. And uh, yeah, I always love having new people come through. So feel free to come say hi. Good stuff. And it's twitch.tv slash? Twitch.tv forward slash grips. Brilliant. It was, it, it was back before we knew that if you put poker in your name, it helped you rank higher on search. And I'm like, I'm already locked in as grips. So <laughs> it's just going to be grips. Good stuff. <laughs> Well, that is Grips to Evan Jarvis. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of the Cards Chat Podcast. I'm Robbie Straczynski. You can follow me on Twitter at Card Player Life, and I wish you all a wonderful day. <laughs>